It feels like there might have been a bit of a recent breakthrough in understanding some of the mechanisms around long COVID uh, with the insights from mast cell activation syndrome and the evidence around viral persistence. But can we dig a little deeper? Why do those particular supplements, uh, niacin, zinc, and selenium, work? Uh, what's actually going on between this wretched coronavirus and this punishing immune cascade we're seeing in our bodies? Well, hang tight, because I'm gonna try and get my soggy, brain-fogged head around it. First, just to bring you up to date on some of the latest research, uh, some more evidence of viral persistence. This preprint found evidence of viral persistence in the olfactory epithelium, that is to say, the surface layer of cells in the roof of the nasal cavity. And this Chinese study found evidence of viral persistence in the GI tract, and that was correlated with low antibody levels. Our study demonstrated that the positive retest patients failed to create a robust protective humoral immune response, which might result in SARS-CoV-2 persistence in the gastrointestinal tract. Remember my study showing only 22% of long haulers tested positive for antibodies? Doesn't take too much adding of two plus two to see that this could be more evidence of viral persistence in the gut disrupting that gut immune axis and, uh, and being responsible for many of the long COVID symptoms that we are seeing. And in this vindicating but hardly uplifting finding from the cover scan study, initial data from 201 patients suggests that almost 70% had impairments in one or more organs four months after their initial symptoms of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So that's the latest state of play in the world of research and initial findings and preprints and so on. Um, going back to that idea of persistence in the gut, which I think many of us are finding makes some kind of intuitive sense. Um, if there is virus still there, what's it actually doing? And how on earth is it creating this bewildering array of symptoms? Well, to, uh, to try and find out, we have to drill down into some fairly serious biochemistry. If you've done biology A-level or, or some other kind of healthcare degree, you may remember that ATP is one of the critical molecules uh, responsible for giving us energy. But the way it's created is pretty complicated, and one of the key enzymes responsible in its production is NAD+, which is found in all living cells and plays critical roles in cellular energy production and signaling pathways. Now, many of you may have already come across this article linking NAD plus deficiency with long COVID. It was based on the hypothesis proposed in this paper by Miller, Wenzel and Richards uh, back in June, uh, which was finally published in November. I asked the author, uh, Nikita Alexandrov, if he could help explain uh, what's actually going on in this cascade between the virus at one end and the uh, array of symptoms at the other. The NAD system is kind of a fundamental energy system in the body and um, really kind of low level fueling, fueling different cell cycles. And uh, that gets disrupted because um, the virus attacks an enzyme which, uh, which kind of burns through your fuel in a way. You're basically just leaking fuel in your body. And uh, to make up for this, your body, um, it, it takes tryptophan and activates alternative pathways. And the tryptophan is kind of a precursor building block you, you get from your diet. Um, your body just kind of dumps all your tryptophan into making more fuel uh, to fill up the leaking fuel tank. And um, as that's happening, you don't have any of that tryptophan to make serotonin. So you have chronically low circulatory serotonin and um, you know, people don't notice it as much because uh, there's different pools of serotonin. You have serotonin um, in circulation and you have a separate kind of isolated pool in your brain. So it's not like everybody's dealing with clinical depression, although that is, you know, your um, mental state is affected through the serotonin, but um, your, your circulatory serotonin is kind of a master modulator, master switching system. So when that goes low, it's not just about your mood, it's about um, you know, delivering signals to the body. So your, your body makes up for not having those neurotransmitters by activating what they call mast cells. Those release serotonin, but in doing so, they also release histamine. And so you have uh, all these kind of widespread inflammatory issues, medicine interactions, um, strange food interactions, histamine intolerance. So it's kind of this uh, 
this knock-on pathway, one energy system is affected and then it just affects so many issues downstream and um, a, a lot of issues with the gut. You know, anytime the serotonin is disrupted, um, the gut's going to be disrupted. Same with the NAD+. Plus. Um, you know, you're just really throwing off your gut brain, gut immune access. And uh, I think that's a big part of long COVID. A lot of um, people don't think about is how the body is just kind of this living system and um, that needs to be brought back into balance too. This could well be the mechanism behind MCAS, as I've discussed in my previous videos. Uh, and if that is the case, then there is some good news because the treatment regimen is exactly the same as I discussed in my recent film with Dr. Tina Pierce. We have to replace the nicotinic acid first of all, so get yourself some niacin, but make sure it's niacin and not nicotinamide. Um, it can cause flushing, so uh, one way of avoiding this is to either get the non-flush variety, although there is some argument this might be slightly less effective, or alternatively just take an aspirin at the same time. Then zinc, selenium, quercetin, vitamin C and vitamin D. I will put the doses in the description. There are still a number of outstanding questions though. Uh, are Afrin et al. right when they say that um, SARS-CoV-2 is infecting the mast cells directly uh, through their ACE receptor and sending them completely rogue? To what degree are autoantibodies also potentially complicating the issue? Uh, and if there is persistent virus in the gut, treating the symptoms of that uh, with treating with deficiency of the NAD plus is only going to get you so far. How do we actually get rid of the virus? Um, ivermectin has looked promising in certain trials. It's commonly being used in India and South America, but it's not available everywhere. If the persistent virus theory turns out to be a dud, uh, and in fact long haulers don't have persistent virus in the guts, um, then it would seem that we would just be looking at this immune system stuck in high gear. And if that's the case, could it be as simple as NAD plus deficiency, which is creating this cascade of compensatory mechanisms? Um, I, I wish it were, but somehow I suspect it probably isn't. And again, we just need more research to try and find the answers to some of these questions. I asked Nikita uh, what research projects he would commission if he could. That's a good question. Um, I'm speaking with Dr. Uh, Adrian Wenzel and his team. We're looking at um, working with a company that I work with and uh, supporting some clinical research. So the two priorities we speak about is, uh, you know, A, you need to do an kind of observational clinical study with long haulers specifically and uh, just basically see, you know, does high dose nicotinic acid correspond to better self-reported outcomes? That's a pretty easy one if uh, clinics are already seeing large volumes of long haulers and they're happy to take, you know, this niacin or nicotinic acid. The other one is um, there needs to be more detailed validation of the mechanism. So with this NAD disruption, certain pathways in the body turn on, the ones that kind of steal the um, tryptophan and serotonin, they, they turn on specifically in long haulers. So we think there's kind of individual, very elegant biomarkers um, that can define if you have these pathway activations. And in the future, you know, you don't want to get a full cytokine panel. Uh, it's better to have one definitive biomarker that can show uh, these pathways are activated. So those are the two experiments, uh, observational clinical research, and then um, looking for kind of single elegant biomarkers that not only validate that these pathways are activating and, and causing all these issues, but can be used as a tool to uh, show somebody is uh, suffering from long COVID. Both very worthy projects. And if there was a single biomarker that could be act as a diagnostic tool for long COVID, would the same also apply to ME and CFS? Could this give them the vindication that uh, people with those conditions have been looking for for 20 or 30 years? Biochemistry at this level is really very complex. Uh, the body is very clever when it comes to homeostasis. That is to say, having coping mechanisms, uh, secondary coping mechanisms to make sure that various different processes remain in check and the body remains in balance. But it looks like COVID-19 manages to disrupt that homeostasis in a way that we can't compensate for without creating serious consequences. And those consequences are the symptoms that create the debilitating long COVID experience. 
I'll dig into this subject more in my next film when I talk to Dr. A. Wenzel, one of the authors of the original paper linking NAD plus deficiency with COVID. Till next time. <laughs>